message of grace is brought to you by Christian people who believe the Bible to be the Word of God and who appreciate its power and authority. Within the pages of the Bible itself, there is a God-given design for its study. Rightly dividing the Word of Truth is the key to understanding the Bible. We're glad you've joined us for another interesting look into God's infallible book as Richard Jordan, president of Grace School of the Bible, presents another in a series of messages designed to help you understand and enjoy the Bible. Let's join them now. We're certainly glad you've joined us again today, and we do trust that our time together in God's Word will prove a real blessing and help to you. So we're going to look again at the book of Ephesians. There, there's no book in the Bible uh, that helps you to understand and perceive uh, the identity that God has given us in Christ, like the book of Ephesians. If you've ever wondered just who you are as a believer, why you're here, and what you're supposed to do, and what God's going to do with you, and why He saved you, well, the book of Ephesians is for you. You would profit very greatly to sit down some time and, and read the book of Ephesians through from one end to the other. There are only 155 verses, 3,039 words. So if you're a dog-slow reader, you could read the book of Ephesians through probably 10 times in one day. When I was a young lad, just I say a lad, I was a teenager, uh, I had an experience with the book of Ephesians that completely revolutionized my life. I was 17 years old, and I was working at the rescue mission in Mobile, Alabama, the Mobile Rescue Mission at 206 State Street. And uh, he, Brother Clyde Reynolds, the superintendent, and, and I, I, was, I was in high school, and during the summer I worked at the mission. And uh, I, was, uh, I worked in the, in the, in the uh, daytime, I, I would take the, the, uh, uh, the, nor the, the, the meetings and so forth. And one of the things that I'd do on, on, on occasions was take the, the mission van, the pickup van, that we would go and pick up clothes and donations and so forth from. And one day I took that van and went off just to have a day by myself, just a, a break. And I went off to a place that I knew and, and sort of out in the, the, uh, uh, the country. And I, I took a, 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 a hammock and I was going to spend the night and I was going to read the Bible during the day and I was going to pray at night. And, and uh, I did what you do, you know, you go have an all night prayer meeting, you just get out there and lay in the hammock and pray and pretty soon, you, you know, it's morning, you slept. <laughs> But that day I did something different. That day I took my Bible and I laid out there on, in, in that field under the shade and I read the book of Ephesians. And I, just, I read the book of Ephesians through. I said, I'm 17 years old. I'm going to read it 17 times. And I don't know, somewhere between the 12th and 15th time that I went through it, instead of me reading Ephesians, it began to read me. And instead of me getting a grip on the book of Ephesians, it got a grip on me. And all of a sudden, this book just came alive in my heart, in my mind. And it wrapped its arms of love and, and, and understanding around my heart. And I've never been able to get away from it again. I can understand why somebody like J. Vernon McGee would call it the, the, the high Sierras of the Word of God. I can understand why somebody would call it the Mount Everest of, God's war, uh, of divine truth. Because when you're in the book of Ephesians, you're up in that rarefied atmosphere of the heavenly places. He starts off by saying, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Do you notice how many times that word blessed is in that verse? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings. I mean, you get the idea when you start the book, that's the third verse in the book. That there's going to be some blessing involved in this. There's something going to make you, that's going to thrill your soul about the benefits that God has given to us when He put us in Christ. And He says they're in heavenly places. You're way up in the heavenlies. Well, when you get down to the end of the book, chapter 1, you're, you're involved in, in Paul praying. God the Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, through Paul, is praying for you. I asked last time, do you ever wonder what God would pray for you? If, he, if, you, were on, if you were on the Holy Spirit's prayer list, what would He pray for you? Well, Paul tells you. You see it here. We're going to see it again when we get in chapter 3. There are some 30 prayers in Paul's epistles 
more than anybody else in the Bible except King David, Paul's prayers are recorded in Scripture so you could understand how the Holy Spirit would pray for you when he prays. You ought to study them. You ought to look at them. You ought to consider the, 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 the thing that's on the mind of God the Holy Spirit when he thinks about you, when he makes intercession for you. You find those things in the Word of God. In this prayer, he prays for three specific things that you need to know. One, you need to know the hope, what is the hope of his calling. Two, what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And three, what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe. That's what he says we need to know. He, he prays that the eyes of our understanding might be enlightened that we might know. You see, when God prays for you, He wants your understand. He wants you to be able to comprehend some things. Your mind is constantly being bombarded by the adversary, by the world, by the flesh, by the devil. Your fleshly mind is constantly being allured away by the things of the world that are designed to promote the philosophy of Satan. The lie of the devil, the lie of Satan, is the deification of the creature. Romans 1.25. That you can be your own authority and get away with it. That's, you know, the middle letter of the word sin in the English language tells you what that is. It's the big I complex. The great definition of sin in the Bible is in Isaiah 53, verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone into our own way. That independence, that, that we're going to do it our way, we're going to be our God. I've said it many times. If you want to be God, just step outside in your front yard and create you a universe and you can be God. And when you can create your universe, you can be God. You say, but... Brother Rick, I can't do that. I know. And you can't be God. You see, that's what we try to do. We try to take in our life by controlling our spouse and our kids and our job and money and circumstances and other people. We try, through the control of all these things, to be the boss, to be God. But we're not God. So it all falls apart eventually. It all comes to naught eventually. You can make it work for a while, but you can make anything work for a while, and then it all comes tumbling down like a house of cards, because we aren't God. God is God, and you're the creature, and the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So if you're going to be God, you've got to make you an earth. You can't, have, you can't take God's, or else you're a, a thief and a robber. You're just like your daddy the devil then, not like God Almighty. Well, anyway, you come back to Ephesians 1, and he prays that we might know. We might know how God thinks. That we might know the, the riches of the glory. What is the hope of his calling? What is the wealth uh, of, uh, of, uh, of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power? Now, we've been over this. Jesus Christ dies at Calvary. You know about his earthly ministry, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He's resurrected. He goes into heaven, sends the Holy Spirit back on the apostles in the Acts period, early Acts period. Then the fall of Israel takes place. And God sets the nation Israel aside. And they are no longer recognized as God's chosen people today. But rather the Lord Jesus Christ from heaven up here saves Saul of Tarsus, makes Saul of Tarsus, Paul the apostle, and forms the church, the body of Christ today in the dispensation of the grace of God. And that's where we are today. And you and I have a calling. God has a purpose for the church, the body of Christ. He's going to one day come, take us out, be with himself in the heavenly places, and that purpose is going to be accomplished. That's why Ephesians is about heavenly places up here where we're, where we're going to be. On the earth... The, the wrath of God in the tribulation period is going to be poured out on this earth. Jesus Christ is going to come back down here and set up his kingdom, not just in the heavens, but on the earth. Satan's going to be bound and thrown away. The loss will be put in the lake of fire and out through the dispensation of the fullness of times. Jesus Christ will reign. We sing the song, Jesus shall reign where the sun does its successive journeys run. His kingdom spread from shore to shore. And that's what it's going to be. 
till way, uh, till 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 um, moon shall wax and wane no more. And that's the way it'll be out there. He'll be king. But he's not just going to be king on the earth. He's going to have a kingdom up here in the heavens. The whole universe is going to be brought under his authority. You and I have a hope. But there's more than that. There's the hope of his calling. We're going to be participating in what he's doing to honor and glorify himself. And so there's the hope of his calling where we're going to share in the glorification of his son in the heavenly places. When Christ comes back, that's why the rapture, over and over when you read that word hope in Paul's epistles, over and over it's a reference to the rapture. He is taking us out and for you, even to the place where your physical body is, made, is fashioned like unto his glorious body. Then we're going to enjoy and be a part of the riches of, the, uh, of his inheritance in the saints when he's going to go up there and take up positions of rank and authority in the heavenly places. All of this is going to be done according to what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. That is all of the things that he's going to do through us and also through Israel but we're talking about us right now is going to be done based upon the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now the resurrection of Christ, when he talks about his mighty power, when he raised him from the dead, of course what the, resur the resurrection is very important. The good news is that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and was raised again the third day. He died because the wages of sin is what? Death. By one man sin entered the world, and death by sin. Death passed upon all men, for that all is sin. The reason you die... The reason love, your loved ones die is not that they don't have enough faith to get healed or enough faith to get God to do something for them. It's because, the, you, know, you know, in spite of all the healing programs that you're ever going to hear, you take all the big shot guys on the TV and all the guys at the church and all the little saints out all around the world out here praying and, and asking God to heal them and all that, in spite of all the healing programs you're ever going to run into, in spite of Mayo Clinic and Ochsner's Clinic and, all, you know, and all, the, all the heart transplants and liver transplants and kidney transplants and, and blood transfusions and operations and doctors and medicine and all the rest, the exercise program, you know, the, the ab masters and the Nordic track and all this stuff going to make you live to 120, all those things are designed to do is make you live longer than your money's going to last. <laughs> but you know, 120 isn't all that very long. In spite of all that, when all that's said and done, the death rate is still one apiece. He didn't stop death. You know why? The only answer to death is life. Jesus died at Calvary. The reason you die is because of sin. That's where it comes from. The reason there are you ride down the road, you see a skull orchard, the cemetery laid out all out there, people, place people are dying to get into, sin puts them there. When Jesus Christ died at Calvary, he didn't have any sin of his own. He says, which of you convinces me of sin? The Bible says he was sinless, holy, undefiled, separate from sinners. Well, he was a friend of sinners. But he separated from them in that he didn't, he didn't enjoy, he didn't participate, he didn't become in his participation a sinner. He never sinned. He never put his hand anywhere it shouldn't have gone. He never had to clear his throat and say, well, excuse me, I made a mistake. He would have made a good politician. He would have made a good preacher in our day. He wouldn't have made a good school teacher in our day. He would have made a good policeman in our day. He, he not like it. You know what he does? He shows you he was made in the likeness of sinful flesh, but he never was sinful flesh. He just made like us. Sin apart. God made him to be sin. The one who knew no sin, well, why did he die? If the wages of sin is death, then he had to have sin placed on him. God made him to be your sin. You see, when he hung there at Calvary's cross, he took all of your mistakes, all of your failures, everything that's wrong with you, and he hung there and he told God the Father, blame me for you. Scarcely for a righteous man would some die. Peradventure for a good man, some might dare to die. But God commended his love toward you in that while you were yet a sinner, you hadn't decided to clean up, you hadn't decided to make it all right, you were just going on your way, fat and happy. 
while you were yet a sinner, Christ died for you. That's how God proves His love towards you. You see, God accepts you because of Calvary the way you are. Not the way you ought to be. The way you are. Because, my friend, you're never going to be the way you ought to be. That's what being a sinner is all about. So what God does is he, Jesus Christ goes to Calvary and He dies and He puts away sin by the sacrifice of Himself. And because sin has been completely put away, He's raised from the dead back to life. If sin produces death and now He's alive, then He has the answer to death. He's put away sin. And He can appear the second time without sin unto salvation. His death com completely puts away sin. That's why we call it the finished work of Christ. He doesn't need to be re-sacrificed. The work doesn't need to be done again. The only payment that is complete, full, and forever for sin, God Himself made it in the person of Jesus Christ at Calvary. What are you going to bring of yours that's going to match that? Hebrews 10 says, Every priest standing daily and offering the same sacrifices over and over and over, which can never take away sin. This man once, one time, offered a sacrifice that never needed to be repeated. See the difference between religion and what he did? What you or some priest or some preacher would do for you and what he did? He did enough. He did it for you. You need to trust him if you never have. You need to receive the gift of eternal life. And if you have trusted him, you find out that that death becomes yours. Now, when God raised him from the dead, this exceeding greatness of his power, would he put away sin? But that verse goes on. He, he says, I want you to understand that all that he's going to do out here, what he's doing now in time and identifying us in Christ, with how he's going to give us this new, new body out here at the rapture, how that he's going to use us in the heavens out there, it's all based back here, and it's all a demonstration of the greatness of the power that God has accomplished through the cross work of Christ. And that power flows through us now out into here. It's well, with, it's with Israel, but we're not Israel. And he gives you some statements about it that I want to go over with you. Verse 20. According to the working of His mighty power which He wrought in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and set Him at His own right hand in heavenly places. Not only did He raise Him from the dead, but He took Him back up into heaven. And He set Him at His own right hand in heavenly places up here. Now what does it mean to be set at the right hand? That's, a, that's, that's, where, that's the, the, the position of power and authority. And God the Father took His Son and set Him at His right hand, the position of inherited authority in the heavenly places, far above all principality, power, might, and dominion. Those terms, principality, power, might, dominion, are, are references to governmental authority. Now, you understand what those terms mean. Come with me, if you will, to Colossians chapter number 1. We use these terms in, in everyday life to describe things on the earth. And you need to understand something about your Bible. Your Bible uses terminology that you are familiar with about your, from your life on earth to describe the things that are going on in heaven. If you ever wondered what heaven is like, the terminology that God uses to describe heaven is terminology that, he, that, that is, is, is used to describe in other places things that go on down here. For example, the city where God lives. Well, you understand what a city is. There's, the, there's a, a garden in that city. You understand what a garden is. And so on and so forth. So there, is a, there are terms that refer to government in the earth, things that are, we understand, principalities, powers, mights, and dominions. Those same 
kind of positions in a different realm, understand. Colossians 1.16, or in heaven. Colossians 1.16, For by him were all things created that are in heaven, up here, and that are in earth, whether they be visible or invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions. You see that? Principalities, powers. Now you know what those things are. Those are positions of what? Of government. That's right. Those are governmental positions. A throne. A seat of governmental authority. A dominion. The territory over which a throne would reign. The principality. You know what a prince is? He's the chief ruler, the chief uh, uh, ruler in a, in, in, in a, in a territory. Powers, the powers that be are ordained of God. Talking about governmental authority, power, the ability to go out and delegate authority to people. We're talking about government in the earth. But there's also government in the heavenly places occupied by the angelic creation, the races of angels that are up there that God created to carry on the business of the government in the heavenly places. Fascinating thing back in 2 Kings chapter 6 when Elisha is, is there and, and he, he tells his servant that uh, the, the enemies of Israel are coming and he says, they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And his, his servant thinks, you know, let's take his temperature and lay the old man down. He's a little whacked. And so Elisha says, Lord, let, let him see into the, the spirit world. And when, he can, when God takes the a shift in this man's spirit so that he, he sees out of the three-dimensional world we live in to, into that other dimension where angels live. He sees the horses and chariots of Israel on the mountains, angels. And the horses with their flesh is like fire. Now you think about that. If the angels, and they have horses and chariots, that tells you it's, it's in the spirit realm, but it's terminology I understand. You see, if, if you've got horses, I know something else that you've got. Well, you've got stables. If you've got chariots, you've got to have some garages to keep them in. If you've got horses, somebody is having to <laughs> take care of them. There's a whole array of life activity going on in the angelic realm. Now, I don't know what it's like because I've never been there, but I know that God uses terminology that I can understand, so it uses about life around me, so I can assume that it's going to be in its realm like what life is in our realm. Keep reading in Colossians. For he is before all things, and by him all things consist. He is the head of the body of the church, which is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. The reason there's a body of Christ is that in all of these positions, he might have preeminence. He'd, be, he'd have the preeminence on the earth through Israel. But there's no way for him to have preeminence in the government in the heavenly places except through the church, the body of Christ. That is the hope of your calling. That is the exceeding riches of his inheritance. He's going to inherit not just the earth, Israel's his inheritance down here, but he's going to inherit the heavenly places through us. And his power, based upon the cross, is going to accomplish it. Watch. Verse 20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, right back here, having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, I say, whether well, it be things in heaven or things in earth. He's literally going to restore the whole system of creation under his headship and authority. And the power, the authority, the ability to get that job done is based in the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said, I want you to know that, about that. I want that power where he's put all things under his feet and made him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth in all in all. We're going to go up and fill up all those positions out there. That's where we're going to spend eternity. 
His power to get all of that done is based on the cross work of Christ. Now what that means to you and me is that God's ability to subdue all things unto himself, the power and authority to get that work done is yours right now if you're a child of God. Do you understand what that means? He says he's made us more than conquerors through him that loved us. You see, God has this, this power that he's going to get all this stuff done with. He gave it to you when you trusted him. He gave his life for you at Calvary. That he might give that life to you the moment you trusted him. That then he might live that life through you. And that life is the life and the power that he's going to get all this accomplished with. It's yours right now. What is there in life then that's going to separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus? Nothing. Your weakness, your fears, your inabilities, your failures, forget it. They can't separate you. What is it that you face today that's going to overcome you? The power that works in you is the power that's going to reconcile the heavenly places back under the authority of Jesus Christ. You're more than a conqueror. Is that how you look at your life today as a child of God? You need to learn to live not defining yourself by your failures, your wishes you were and your wannabes, but defining yourself by who God has really made you in His Son. Come to appreciate that I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave Himself for me. Live like who you really are in Christ, and enjoy that victory for His glory. Tune in again with us next time. Until then, Maranatha. Brother Jordan, for that message from the Word of God. Friends, we have a cassette tape that we'd like you to have to go along today's study. It's yours free of charge. It's our way of saying thanks for listening. We'll be happy to see that you receive your free copy along the free subscription to our Bible study periodical, The Grace Journal, if you simply write us here at the Message of Grace. The address should be on your screen. That's the Message of Grace, Box 97, Bloomingdale, Illinois, 60108. If you prefer, you can also call us during regular business hours at area code 630-529-0520. The Message of Grace is a ministry of Grace School of the Bible, and we're glad you've been with us here today. If our study together has been a help to you, we'd be happy to put you in touch with the Bible study in this area where the message of God's wonderful grace is proclaimed from His rightly divided Word. And friend, if you are still not sure of salvation, that your sins are forgiven, and that you have eternal life as a present possession, let us know and be happy to send you some gospel literature that will show you the way. The address again is the Message of Grace, Box 97, Bloomingdale, Illinois, 60108. Thanks for being with us today, and God's best and next time for another Message of Grace.